My mission is simple, to make you money. I'm here to level the playing field for all investors. There's always a bull market somewhere, and I promise to help you find it. Mad Money starts now. Hey, I'm Kramer. Welcome to Mad Money. Welcome to Kramerica. Other people want to make friends. I'm just trying to save you some money. My job is not just to entertain, but to educate and explain. So call me at 1-800-743-CBC or tweet me at Jim Kramer. Sometimes everything seems to go wrong, and it makes you just want to throw in the towel, doesn't it? But after a day like today, where the averages started really strong, then collapsed, then rebounded, then pulled back again, Dow ultimately declining 46 points, this being sinking 0.58%, and the Nasdaq losing 1.15%. I'd argue at this point, maybe after such a sell-off, that it's better you just kind of hold on. Maybe you just hold on for a couple of percentage point decline, and then we'll be so oversold we can reverse again. After all, we did bounce every day, if only for a 20-year uh, treasury auction. That went much better than fear. While the rebound was indeed short-lived, it did give you a better chance to sell than at the lows. Although there were better moments to sell at the beginning of the day, when it looked like the market was going to skyrocket. It's exhausting. But tonight I want to put myself in the shoes of the seller, okay? The one who's really in control right now, not the ones who sold at the bottom, forget them. But the ones who held on and got back to even, at least for this session. I will never, ever fight any viewer who wants to just dump all the stock. It's not my style to fight. But it's also not my style to do that. However, not many things are working. And we've had a huge run. It's natural to ring the register, isn't it? Nobody wants to turn a profit into a loss. Plus, the stock market is ignoring anything positive about companies that report upside surprises while staying laser-focused on the negatives. J.B. Hunt, big trucking company number four, reported numbers that were disappointing by its own admission. Stock dropped 8%. Same with Prologis, the biggest warehouse company in the country. That saw its stock plunge more than 7% today on what I thought was a shocking lowered forecast. These two companies used to generate impressive growth. Now they're uh, offering subpar numbers. Worse, they were quoting very loudly not that long ago about how well they were doing, especially Prologis on our own show just last month. Neither saw this weakness coming. I was very, very disappointed in this. We also had plenty of big picture negatives. Long term interest rates are rising, commodity prices are rising, oil is soaring, Europe's very soft, the Middle East is close to the brink after Iran fired missiles at Israel. The past few sessions have been rough. But today, let's see, oil plummeted, broader commodity complex got hit, Europe's looking a little brighter, Israeli government seems to be uh, leaning toward restraint. Yet those positives only seem to matter for about an hour. Hey, you get some green shoots and the bear just savages them with a sickle. Doesn't make you want to give up. It, It does. Especially when the Nasdaq seems to be breaking down really badly after a magnificent run. Oh, and let's not forget that you can get 5% for just sticking your money in a certificate of deposit. Wow, days like today, doesn't it feel good? Look, this is a market that wants to go down, as I used to say at my old hedge fund. It's very easy to say the valuations are stretched. We hear that all day. It's easy to convince yourself that when the bellwethers like Apple or Tesla or NVIDIA roll over, and boy, are they rolling over, that nothing else can work. So you just get out of Dodge. But is that really a good reason to just sell everything? No. And you never sell all at once, even if you think it's time to go. For the Chapel Trust, we did something different. We sold stock at almost every day in the last four weeks, something I guess you would have known if you joined the the CBC Investing Club. We did think some valuations were momentarily overstretched, and not after the decline. We didn't want to lose all of our positions, so we did something called scaling out, meaning as the stock went higher, we sold some shares to raise some cash. If it ever comes back down, we can always use that cash to scale back in. We figured the market might have a short-term peak because the Fed may have jumped the gun. When they told us they no longer needed to raise rates, we've been very skeptical of the Fed's dot plots calling for three rate hikes, this three rate cuts this year. I mean, no central banker cuts rates quickly when unemployment is below 4% for heaven's sake, and we start getting overheated inflation numbers. And that's why we were adamant that there could be no rate cuts until we saw some weaker economic numbers somewhere, anywhere. I also recognize that this is an aggravating tape, but get this. When I saw Abbott Labs put up terrific numbers this morning, raising the low end of the forecast, only for its stock to just get annihilated. Well, I know this market's got two negative. We bought some Abbott today for the trust. We're going to keep buying in a weakness gradually. Abbott's numbers were actually terrific. Nobody even bothered to listen. Nevertheless, let me do this. Let me go over what's really ailing in this market and what might cause it to keep going down, because that's a very real possibility, people. First, you know what? Investors aren't buying the dips here. We get any rally and sellers come out of the woodwork and blast any buyers. This change in tactics is what's killing the NASDAQ. 
That's why I couldn't maintain any advance today. Who buys a dip knowing that your head might be blown off it after a percentage of gain? Second, many stocks have had parabolic moves. I've talked to you about that nightly. They've rallied practically straight up, like a parabola. When you see these, you should remember high school algebra because parabolas go right back down just as fast. That's what's happening. We're now reversing the problem. and We're now going down. When that happens, stocks then shift to what's known as a head and shoulders pattern, with the head being at the top of the problem. So many names have made that bearish pattern in the last few days, where you just need to wait until the stock stops going down. Don't worry. It's not hard to tell. If the stock's way down from the highs and you've already sold some at higher levels, you got my blessing to start buying them back at a lower level. But uh, not more than that. Why not buy more? Because thirdly, this market is not yet oversold, given from where we're coming from. In the investing club, we take advantage of the special deal we have with this market edge to get the S&P oscillator every day, right after 4 p.m. And I don't want to get aggressive at the buy until we get uh, an oscillator that reads minus 7, which means that there's really a huge amount of selling pressure. It hit minus 6 and change today. I got to wait till 7. That's not enough to cure the ugliness, even as this is now the longest downturn since January. Fourth, I was concerned that many people were clinging to the hope of rate cuts. Rate cuts that are unimaginable in a world where there's so much economic activity and so few workers. There's an incredible amount of business formation. There are more and more mergers and IPOs. None of that's what you want to see when the Fed's trying to cool down the economy. I think Chairman Powell was willing to cut rates when we got some weak numbers. Uh, But these recent numbers are way too high. It resets the clock on potential rate cuts. We need to see at least two months of cooler numbers before the Fed even considers cutting. Right now, there is no sign in this economy of any slowdown other than pro Lodges and J.B. Hunt. Finally, the market tells you when the endless selling has finally come to an end. Usually you get a day when the market starts down, not up like it did today. Down big. Therefore, it gives you a chance to get in after the washout. You get a whoosh. You get a crescendo of selling. An upstart like we have today is a nightmare. You need to wash out all these people before you can bottom. And we're not near that yet. Do you think all the sellers of Tesla are done now that there's a chance to amend Elon Musk's salary package while the company's reportedly delayed Cybertruck deliveries without explanation? Do you think all the sellers in NVIDIA are done now that everyone's convinced that Amazon, Alphabet, and Meta are producing competing chips, even as they said over and over again, that's not the case. It's like my interview with CEO Jensen Wong from NVIDIA explaining all this never happened. Hey, can Apple really bottom on every day we get this torture number cut? So here's the bottom line. If you want to get out, go ahead. But I would say that the time to sell was when the market was going parabolic. The time to buy is when the parabola finishes, comes down dramatically. We don't know when that moment will come yet. But at this point, you sure aren't buying at the top, are you? And you are more likely coming in near the end of the great parabola. How about we go to Tyler in California to start? Tyler. Hey, Big Booyah from California. How are you doing, Jim? I am doing well. How about you? I'm doing good. Thanks for asking. I bought this IPO at $51 per share. And I wish I had just bought more. But at the same time, I like my average being 51 I'm diamond handing arm. What's your take on averaging up? You know, I, we talked about arm today in the office. And... Uh, All of us said the same thing. What a great company. But where the heck should it be worth now that it gone parabolic to all the way up to the mid 100s and now come back down? And the consensus was that it might go down into the 80s. And that is where we would feel comfortable owning or buying some. Remember, great company. Renee Ha is doing a great job. But the market's changes complexion. Let's go to Georgie in Pennsylvania. Georgie. Hi, Jim. Joining your club was one of the best investments I've made. I can't thank thank you enough for all your help. Thank you. We are really digging in. I took some time off my vacation because I did not want to leave leave Jeff Marks alone in this sell-off, and uh, we just hope we don't let you down. How can I help you now? You certainly have not. I had planned to add shares of Palo Alto on pullback, both in my portfolio and for grandchildren accounts. Should I reconsider due to the class action lawsuit? No. As a matter of fact, we got our first note, which indicates that things are going better than expected at Palo Alto. An analyst said, you know what? We think the, that some of the, that the worst may be behind them. Why, why that is? They were brought in by United Health's uh, division that was hacked. And they are the single source of truth for United Health. If they, would, if they were doing so badly, why would they get the single best contract of the year when it comes to cyber terrorism? Let's go to Sonny in Illinois. Sonny. Hey, Jim, a big sunny booyah to you, my friend from Illinois. I'll take it. What's happening? 
Hey, I just want to start off by giving a shout to your staff, Nicole, and everybody there. They are phenomenal, my friend. They are the best, and they they make people feel good because they're polite and they're kind, and that's what I want to see from people at this point in my career. We have nice people here, and I just think that's terrific. How can I help? And so are you. You're nice people, too, my friend. Uh, If I get upset. But, you know, I'm pretty good normally. I'm a perfectionist. I'm a perfectionist. I mean, you know, I tell my wife, I said, listen, it's got to I, I can't stay with you tonight. I got to work. I mean, that's why I felt last night. It was not well received. It's OK. Yeah, exactly. Speaking of wives, my wife, Amal, my son, Jimmy and my son, Zachary, are huge fans of you and your show. Thank you. And uh, and last but not least, wanted to give a shout out to your morning show with Carl and David. You guys oh, do a phenomenal job I in the love morning. Those guys. And the by speed. the way, David is my friend. He doesn't seem like it. I get that. <laughs> you know, I was wondering. Sometimes you guys get a little rough on each other there in the morning, but that's all for fun, right? Uh, yeah, a lot of times. <laughs> All right, Jim. Well, let's get down to business, man. I'm a longtime fan, investment club member, and oh, a fan great. of your book. Thank you. Yeah. So I know you love Ford. I know you love Farley. I know right. you own it for your charitable trust. Ford's come down about maybe 10 to 15% off its recent high, and it's sitting yes. around 12, almost near its 200 day moving average. Now, Mr. Farley's going to be reporting earnings next week. Can you tell me, the investment club members and all your fans, and stare sure. at that TV screen and push that button, bye, 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 ahead of the earnings? Right. Well, look, I have to tell you, this stock has, you so used, everything you said is nice. Thank you for saying this stuff about the staff. I will tell you this. This stock has come down a great deal, as you said, in the last few weeks, and I would buy it ahead of the quarter. The ones that are five, six uh, times earnings like United Airlines, look how well they did. Ford's like that. I think the time to sell out of this market was when it was going parabolic. And now we're well past that. We don't know when the moment will come to buy. I admit that. But I just know this. You aren't buying this market at the top anymore if you come in and start doing some purchasing mad money tonight. Earnings season has begun with the big banks kicking things off late last week. And I am taking the big six head on. Give you my take, and boy, is there a lot to learn. Then, from big banks to regionals, I'm checking with, with a Tennessee bank called First Horizon, 160 years to see how they're doing. And I got a bone to pick with the way we handle antitrust in this country, and I'm laying all the reasons out why I think maybe it needs to change. It's a little anti-business. Stay with Kramer. Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Cramer on X. Have a question? Tweet Cramer. Hashtag Mad Mentions. Send Jim an email to madmoney at cnbc.com. Or give us a call at 1-800-743-CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com. Last Friday, first quarter earnings season kicked off with three major banks, J.P. Morgan Chase, Wells Fargo, and Citigroup. And then on Monday and Tuesday, we heard from Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, and Bank of America. These results came during a rocky period for the overall market, which is one reason nearly all the big bank stocks sold off hard. But some of them got hit a lot harder than others. More importantly, when you actually go through the quarters of the action, the banks just doesn't seem to reflect the quality of the numbers. J.P. Morgan got killed. City got killed. Bank of America got killed. Meanwhile, Wells Fargo, Goldman were flat, and Morgan Stanley was up in a decent amount over this three-day period. So tonight, I want to walk you through what we heard from the big banks, because these are some of the most important companies out there, and they give us a tremendous in- amount of insight into the rest of the economy. They often are predecessors to what's going to happen after. The insight only matters if you really know what happened rather than just extrapolating from the tape, which is what most people do. So we're going to start with the four big money centers, and then we're going to go to the two major investment banks after the break. Yes, these are that important. Let's start with J.P. Morgan. Now, this is generally considered the best-run and strongest bank in the country, even as the stock was hit the hardest. If that wasn't because uh, it wasn't, it, you got to understand this, it was not because the numbers were bad. J.P. Morgan delivered a top beat. Uh, bottom beat with 8% earnings growth. That's terrific. Average loans up 3% when you back out their acquisition of First Republic. Loans are up 16% when you include the First Republic numbers. And why not include them for heaven's sake? JP Morgan had extremely solid expense management, too. Their credit metrics mostly look good. In fact, this bank's provision for credit losses came in a nearly a billion dollars lower than expected, down 32% versus the previous quarter. That's sensational. Well, then you're probably asking, what the heck went wrong? 
Well, you could argue that J.P. Morgan's core net interest income, this is this NII thing, forecast for 2024 was only raised by a tiny amount. Wall Street was hoping for higher for longer rates would help them post bigger net interest margins, which many banks are having. Didn't help the Jamie Dimon. He was so cautious in his comments. But mainly, I think the stock had simply run too much in the quarter. It was up 15 percent year to day, 52 percent of the previous 12 months, right before the company reported. Hey, throw in the ugly market that day and you had a recipe for a sell off, even though the numbers were just fine. That said, the stock has reversed so hard at this point that it's lost a lot of its premium. You know what? That makes it a lot more attractive than when it reported. I was kind of thinking, hmm, maybe this is a good level. Slightly later on Friday morning, Wells Fargo reported this charitable trust name got the best response from the market. That day, with its stock down less than a half a percent, at one point it was up nicely. Wells delivered a meaningful sales and earnings beat, even as average loans were down 2% year over year, average deposits were down 1%. Those lines aren't as important for this bank, though, because it still has a Fed mandated asset cap. Expense management was solid, credit metrics, I thought, looked really good. How about the forecast? Wells Fargo maintained its four-year guidance for net interest income and net interest expenses, and management confirmed that they plan to buy back more stock in 2024 than they did last year. Well, talk about a vote of confidence. Overall, it was a solid, if unspectacular, quarter from Wells. But you know what? In the banking business, unspectacular is fine. We've owned Wells Fargo for the Travel Trust for more than three years, betting on a turnaround. The idea is that they're gradually getting better operationally and putting up clean quarters, and that will eventually cause the regulators to ease up, please, and allow the stock to earn a higher price earnings multiple. With that in mind, I think CEO Charlie Sharp and his team did exactly what they needed to do. This stock is still below where it was six years ago. Hey, that's compelling in itself because it's a much better bank now than it was then. Citigroup was on the fi- was, that was the final bank report on Friday, and the expectations were much lower here because city has been an extremely long-term underperformer. Fortunately, COJ and Fraser pushed through a big restructuring plan last year. So now we're looking at steady results. And you know what? That's what we got. City delivered a solid revenue beat and a substantial earnings beat, management reiterating both their four-year forecast and their longer-term targets. Hey, I'll take that. That's why the stock initially headed, uh, was heading higher on Friday morning for quickly reversing and then traded lower, especially during the conference call. City ended the day down 1.7%. And it was the second worst performer of the six major banks over the three days from Friday through yesterday. Disappointing. Why did this happen? Why did it reverse? City had some negative credit quality trends in the retail services business. You got to think consumer credit cards. Management warned that the division will continue to have higher than expected net, char- net credit losses through the current quarter and possibly the full year. I did not like that. They tried to frame these numbers from a post-pandemic return to normalcy, but the comments here really spooked a lot of people, including me. At the same time, I think there was a lot of profit taking in City because the stock had run from the high 30s last October to the low 60s earlier this month. Yep, as I said at the top, you got to be aware of these parabolic moves. People are betting on a turnaround, but they didn't know if the turnaround would work, so they look for any excuse to ring the register, and that's exactly what they did, honestly. It's the uh, responsible move, I think. Finally, Bank of America reported yesterday morning, and this is a conundrum. I mean, Wall Street didn't like it. Stock falling 3.5% response. At one point, it was down 5%. Did it deserve to get punished? You know what? I'm, I'm going to position myself as being uh, on the fence. I hate being on the fence, but that's where I am. Bank of America's quarter was solid enough with a healthy revenue beat and decent earnings beat, positive. However, unlike the other money center banks, Bank of America's provision for credit losses was merely in line with expectations. With everybody else's number was actually smaller than expected. The company's seeing elevated write-offs in commercial loans, primarily because they have more exposure, here we go, to office real estate than any of the other big boys apart from Wells Fargo, which reported benign credit metrics. For what it's worth, managers said they expect lower losses from the office properties this quarter with a notable decline in the second half. But right now they have more exposure to the bad stuff than I thought. More importantly, at least for me, Bank of America said they'd expected their net interest income, that's at NII again, to fall in the first quarter. But actually grew. That's a positive. As we're talking about the core banking, uh, banking business here, management now says they expect their net interest income to fall in the second quarter, but quickly rebound from those lows. Bank of America was much more positive than the other big banks on the net, this net interest uh, margin front. In the end, though, there was a lot of trust us. Things will get better in the back half of the year. And that's hard for many investors to swallow, particularly with a bank. Now, if you believe Bank of America's management, you know what I do, because I think they're very reliable then maybe this pullback is a buying opportunity. Then again, I cannot blame anyone for not wanting to stick their neck out on the bank stock in this tape. Bottom line, 
you want to take your cue from the bank stocks, keep in mind that the big money center banks reported mostly OK to decent numbers, even if that's not reflected in their stocks, which had run into earnings. Stick around, though. And we're going to go through two major investment banks that got a much better reception than the money centers. And that reception is not over. Mad Money is back after the break. Coming up, more major earnings from the big banks. Kramer's bankable take on the financials continues next. Now that we've heard from all the major banks this earnings season, I want to walk you through the results one by one. Because these companies reported during an ugly period for the market, and I, I don't think they're getting their due. That's certainly how it felt when we went over, remember we went over the major money center banks just now before the break. But what about the other two? The two big investment banks, that's Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley. They reported on Monday and Tuesday. Now, these two firms are more levered to capital market activity. You know, I want you to think that's about stocks and bonds, less reliant on consumer banking. So there's less of a myopic focus on these metrics like this net interest income I keep mentioning or deposit and loan growth or provisions for credit losses. They don't like to have credit. They don't like to give it out. Well, the outlook for the big uh, money centers bank is more muddled. Right now, we know we've got a big rebound in capital markets activity, which is terrific for the investment banks. Not as important for most commercial banks. Got to know what, what a company's lever to. I always tell you that. Let's start with Goldman Sachs, which I argue reported the best quarter in the group on Monday morning. My old firm gave you a monster revenue beat. They brought, they brought in, listen to this, $14.21 billion, $14 billion. Wall Street was only looking for $13 billion. 16% revenue growth year over year, 26% growth versus the previous not so hot quarter. At the same time, Goldman had impressive expense control, which translated to a gargantuan beat. Get this they earned $11.58 per share. And was only looking for $8.73. That's 32% earnings to it from a bank. You know what? That's the old Goldman. Solid, meaningful, surprise on all lines. What's driving these numbers? Goldman had tremendous strength in the global banking and market segment, which houses its investment banking and sales and trading operations. Revenue was up 15% year over year. Investment banking was up 32% year over year. That's extraordinary. Fixed income, currency, and commodities trading up 10%. Equity trading up 10%. All substantially better than expected. Goldman's other two segments, asset and wealth management and platform solution, which is the small consumer business that they're trying to de-emphasize, both did well with double-digit revenue growth. But the real story was the booming business on the investment banking and broker side. As CEO David Solomon explained in the conference call, I'm going to quote him here. It's clear that we're in the early stages of a reopening of the capital markets with the first few months of 2024 seeing a reinvigoration in new issue market access, end quote. In short, maybe it's just getting started. So let's not overthink this one. Ever since we heard from the major investment banks the last time they reported, I've been telling you that we're witnessing a return of capital markets activity and It'll be very good for their numbers. Sure enough, that's exactly how it played out. Goldman's practically printing money here. I think the stock is a buy and a weakness, like we got yesterday. But unfortunately, I'm not the only one who arrived at that conclusion. Otherwise, the stock would have roared today. Remember what I said. These banks can be great tells for the future economy of the country, not just their industry. Goldman's quarter made me feel better for the entire market, despite how negative it's become. Finally, how about Morgan Stanley, which we own for the Chapel Trust? The thing about Morgan Stanley is that it's been shifting away from traditional riskier investment banking and embracing more of a wealth asset management business. I like that model. I'm glad I own this one because it jumped 2.5% yesterday in response to the quarter and it kept climbing today. Remember, I meaning my charitable trust. As I told CNBC Investing Club members in an alert yesterday, the positive reaction from Morgan Stanley was a relief as this position has been testing our patience of late. The stock had been lagging the group as the market sizes up its new CEO, Ted Pick, who took over at the beginning of the year. James Gorman retired. The latest frustration came last Thursday when the stock dropped more than 5% in response to a Wall Street Journal article about a federal investigation. They were looking into the company's vetting practices for its wealth management business, which is now its bread and butter. Hey, to be fair, the gains of the past few days just represent Morgan Stanley recouping some of that ground that was lost, not even all of it. Still, this was a good quarter. Morgan Stanley delivered a substantial revenue beat driven by higher asset prices and an improved macroeconomic backdrop, which helped their wealth management business tremendously. Tremendously. Even though their net interest income came in weaker than expected, remember, it's not as important for them. And it was more than offset by the strength in their fee-based income, which is very important. Clearly, a shift to wealth and asset management, it is working. Hey, by the way, Morgan Stanley uh, reached $7 trillion in client assets at the end of the quarter. That's between the, its wealth and asset management divisions, and it is up more than 18% year over year. Management says they're well on their way to the goal of $10 trillion in client assets. I thought they were slipping. Apparently not. 
The firm's institutional uh, security segment, that's investment banking as well as sales and trading, also had a good quarter, led by strong numbers for equities, trading, and underwriting. As with Goldman Sachs, the traditional part of the business is doing well. Capital markets activity picking up. Expense control solid, too. So it all added up to a 35-cent earnings beat off a $1.67 basis. That's 19% earnings growth year over year. And thank heavens, because last time they had a beat, but it didn't look good when you went underneath. Underneath this time, it looked good. The cherry on top was when Pick addressed this last week's federal investigation news. He took, put it head on in the conference call. As he said, I'm going to quote here, this is not a new matter. We've been focused on our client onboarding and monitoring process for a good while. We have ongoing communications with the regulators, as all the large banks do, end quote. He then continued, quote, we have been spending time, effort, and money for multiple years, and it's ongoing. We've been on it, and the costs associated with this are largely in the expense run rate, end quote. I really like that. I don't want any more investigations of any company my trust owns. I hate being surprised by these banks. In short, don't worry about that terrifying Wall Street Journal piece about an investigation into the wealth management vetting uh, practices. Morgan Stanley sees this as just a run-of-the-mill interaction with regulators. Any costs that come from it should already be baked in the numbers. I said, Phew, but I still I don't like surprises. But I do think that this was one of those that was overdone. Clearly, Wall Street bought it, and I certainly hope it's true. That's just one reason why this quarter was a big relief for the Chapel Trust. Morgan Stanley's doing well, but we'll keep watching closely to see how this situation develops. So where do we ultimately come down on these big banks? While most of these stocks ended up lower after that three-day stretch of earnings, these weren't all bad reports. Not even mostly bad. Most of them were actually better than expected, although a few of the banks got hit by specific issues like the consumer credit quality numbers from Citi or the office uh, real estate loan losses for Bank of America. As for the sell-off in J.P. Morgan, it was mainly a victim of high expectations. But Wells Fargo gave you steady numbers, which was all we needed. It's a buy. And as for Goldman and Morgan Stanley, they are doing great. And their stocks did great, too. And it might be early in their turn because, as what David Solomon, CEO of Goldman, said, it's just getting started. Here's the bottom line. When you go through the actual results of the big banks, they're pretty good. I feel much better about the group than I did last week, even if their stocks don't yet tell the story. And the market has gotten really hard. Sam in Colorado, Sam. Jim, how are you? I am doing well. How about you? I'm all right, Jim. You know, among the sea of red that I see today that is our regional bank, one company in particular seems to stand out, and that's the Wilmington Savings Fund Society. You know, they made an acquisition of Bryn Mawr Trust, which is a really well-regarded bank, back in 2020. And I'm curious what you think about the company's ability to grow organically in this great environment. Um, I'm glad you mentioned Bryn Mawr Trust. That is a very, very good bank. It used to be a very big position for my uh, old hedge fund a long time ago. Uh, look, the stock, it doesn't have a good yield, 1.4%. Uh, it is at or uh, it's yeah, it's five points off its high. I think there are better fish to fry. I like it, but I like First Horizon even more. OK, if you want to have a, a regional bank, FHN is the one I want to be because you get a four percent yield. And the yield safe. How about John in Florida? John. Booyah, Jim. Wow. Booyah right back at you. Hey, Jim, I'm seeing a lot of toast in restaurants and I'm not talking bread. I'm talking T.O.S.T. What do you think? You know, I've been uh, I have been very circumspect because uh, having run two restaurants, I felt that this business is you can pull them out, put them in, pull them out. But they do have some special characteristics, including the best way to be able to actually pay at the uh, while you're at your table. I think the stock's too expensive. They're not making enough money. I wait till it comes in because it's up 24 percent for the year. And then I would buy it. How about we do this below 20? I like it. All right. Now uh, that we've gotten through all the big banks earnings, I feel much better about the group than I did last week, even if some of their stock prices don't tell the story. Much more mad ahead, including my exclusive with First Horizon. After calling off its merger with TD Bank, the stock has finally recovered from this lows. So is now the time you can start to bank on this regional financial with 4% yield? I'm going to check in with the CEO. Then I think this administration needs to approach the antitrust a bit differently. I'm sharing where the focus is now and where I think it need be. And of course, all your calls rapid fire tonight's edition of the lightning round. So stay with Kramer. already heard from the major banks, we're starting to get results from the smaller regional banks, a group that was in dire straits a year ago. Take First Horizon, long my fave, a Tennessee-based regional bank that had agreed to sell itself to TD Bank for $25 per share, only for the deal to fall apart last spring, causing the stock to plunge below $9. We were still in the midst of last year's 
mini banking crisis. Don't forget that. Since then, though, the stock's rallied more than 50% from its lows because it never should have been down cheap in the first place. And today it jumped another 1.9% after First Horizon reported a top and bottom line beat, with management raising their full year guidance for, n- for non interest income. But even after this move, it's only at $14 and change, so could it have more room to run? Let's check in with Brian Jordan. He's the chairman and CEO of First Horizon. You get a better read in the corner, Mr. Jordan. Welcome back to Mid Money. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. All right. So before we get into how the quarter was, which was quite good, I want to congratulate you for 160 years in business. Maybe people don't know that. And you've gone from a, a Memphis outfit to pretty much a one of the dominant players in the fastest growing area of the country, the southeast. So what do you uh, attribute the uh, excellent performance and duration that your bank has been able to have during this period? Well, thank you for the congratulations. I'm excited about what we've accomplished over the last 160 years. It, it really is somewhat uh, uh, hard to think about. Abraham Lincoln was president when we were founded, and we were founded in the midst of the Civil War. And to be in a 12-state franchise today, I give a lot of tribute to the, the associates in the organization today and the tens of thousands that came before us really building a connection with our customers and our communities. Now, let's talk about that because you've got a deposit campaign. It seems like it, uh, last year people were worried about uh, whether you would have deposits. Now it seems like you're the great aggregator of deposits. We've had very good success. Our teams have done a fantastic job. In the second quarter alone, we raised $6 billion, roughly 10% of our deposit base in new to bank deposits. 32,000 new to bank accounts, 6,000 of those being commercial and the other 26,000 being retail accounts. It's really impressive what our team has done and they built on it in the third quarter. They built on it even further in the fourth quarter and we had good deposit trends in the first quarter of this year as well. Can you give us the color of what the commercial are? Because I know that you've got a good franchise business. Yeah, we, we have a, a very broad commercial-based banking business. We have a number of, of specialty businesses, everything from mortgage, warehouse lending, retail, restaurant, franchise, finance, to uh, straight asset-based lending. And then we're a very strong commercial middle market lender all across our footprint. So our, our commercial base serves a broad economy. At the same time, though, it, your commercial base did not seem to be uh, riddled with the kind of commercial real estate that we're all worried about. We, our commercial real estate portfolio continues to be very, very good. We have a very diversified portfolio. And in fact, in the disclosures we put out in our earnings portfolio, we broke it down both geographically and by a collateral type. We've taken very strong uh, credit positions in terms of borrower commitment down payment. At the same time, we've worked to not get overexposed in any asset category or geographic market. And as a result, that portfolio has performed extraordinarily well. I'm very grateful that you did it geographically. When I looked at it, uh, you're the only one so far that has given me that information. It makes me feel more confident, not less. The more information, the better. Now, you did say something that I want to be sure about. You said... Uh, Loan demand, okay, not great. What would make it great? I think that that's exactly what I said. It is okay. The economy is is doing okay or well. It's it's not a strong economy in my view. There's still a lot of pressure from uh, inflation and, in particular, higher rates. And as a result, loan demand has, has not been off the charts. It has just been okay. And, and I expect that that will improve. What will make it better is more certainty about the direction of the economy, that the Fed is going to be able to stick, so to speak, the, the soft landing that everybody is hoping for and looks possible at this point. But I think it's going to take a little bit more clarity. And I think to the extent that rates can start moving down, it's going to make it easier and necessarily cheaper, but it's going to make it easier for people to lean in and borrow more money. Will there be a time where that will be the focus and not uh, net interest income? Now, your net interest income was terrific. And you did point out that uh, what would happen at the higher end of that guidance, more, in other words, fewer hikes, uh, fewer cuts, definitely less rate cuts, you would do better. But I just think at a certain point, we got to be bankers. We can't be bean counters. I think you're a banker and you're a lender 
And I think that there's too many people in this business who just say, all right, how much did you make off that deposit? I want to see lending and I want to see fees. When will that be the focus of Wall Street? I, th- I think it's going to be a focus, whether it's late this year or next, I'm not certain. But clearly, it is, it is not about the subcomponents of our business. We don't, don't push exclusively on fees. We don't push exclusively on deposits. And we don't ex- push exclusively on loans. We want to build broad, deep relationships and serve our customers in deep and meaningful ways. Essentially, as I said on our call this morning, create long-term partnerships that survive and endure and and work through any number of, of cycles, which we're invariably going to have in our economy. One last question. Uh, I know that the mayor of Kansas City was saying uh, to the East, send us your immigrants. We have too many jobs and not enough people. Is your area a too many job, not enough people area? We in the South, we still have a shortage of workers. It has come more in balance, but it is still out of balance. We need more workers. And and I think that will persist. We, we're seeing a lot of people moving into the South and that dictates a strong economy. A strong economy dictates you need workers. And so I think we're coming in into better balance, but I don't think the problem is solved today. Is the government in the way or is it helpful? I think, you know, having a sensible immigration policy is probably the most important thing to solving that problem long term. The, the birth rate in the U.S. Is, is not likely to be sufficient to create all the workers that we need in this economy. And I think we've got to solve the, the immigration issues, which draw a lot of passion on both sides of the argument. But ultimately, we've got to come to a sensible conclusion on that. And then if I am a First Horizon shareholder, you bought back, you've got uh, the authority to buy, repurchase $650 million of your own shares, which this is not uh, J.P. Morgan. That's a lot of money and a lot of shares. Yeah, absolutely. We bought a little over 10 million shares or $154 million in the first quarter of this year. We have another $500 million of share authorization. We've got a 11.3% CET1 ratio, which is the shorthand for the regulatory ratio that we work off of. So we believe we have the ability to operate at around 11% plus earnings this year. We think we have capacity to buy back some more stock over the course of the next two or three quarters. And while we think it's on sale, we think it's a great opportunity to accumulate and redistribute capital to our shareholders. And with a 4% yield and with the record you have, it is definitely on sale. Brian Jordan is the chairman, president, and chief executive officer of First Horizon Corp. It is always a delight to have you on, and I love a straight shooter. Thank you. Thank you. Dan Money's back here. Right. Coming up. Hit us with your best shot. An electrified fast fire lightning round is next. It is time. It's time for the lightning round. Because remember, that's where your calls are. I'm going to say, stock said, bye bye bye. So, 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 and then the lightning round is over. Are you ready, Ski Daddy? Cover the lightning round, crazy much, but go to Chuck in Arizona. Chuck. Hi, it's uh, King Charles here. Hey, King. What's up? Yeah. Uh, we speak again, my investing friend. Um, I'm going to dedicate the Pet Shop Boys song, Opportunity, to us. You've got the brain. I've got the brawn. Together, let's make a lot of money. Well, there you go. I like that. All right. It's kind of like Mozart meets Beethoven, I guess. Okay. Um, last month, I took a position to hop on the energy trade in ExxonMobil. It shot up like a SpaceX rocket in the last couple of months. It's- parabolic move, my friend. We don't like parabolic moves. That's a very good example. So it goes to 123. It's only 118. I don't think that parabolic move ends until at least it gets to 110. Let's go to Devin in Florida. Devin. Booyah, Jimmy Chu. It's Devin from Florida. I love hey, this Devin. show, by the way. I just wanted to tell you that. Thank you. I wanted to know your outlook on Marathon Digital and its relationship. Okay, if you want to own Marathon Digital, just go buy either Ethereum or buy Bitcoin. Okay, let's not fool around. That's what you do. Let's go to George in Arizona. George. Big hump day booyah, Jim. Oh, it is hump day. The land of chips out here in Arizona. All right, let's go to work. Let's go to work. 
I like our last picks, and I think we're moving in the right direction on the AI trade. How about if we add some power to those big data centers? What do you think about a stock SMR symbol, new scale power? Right. Um, okay, so when it comes to data centers, I am inclined to say that no power company is going to make money off of it, and you better buy better to buy Vertiv or Eat. That's the way to do it. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the conclusion of the Lightning Round. The Lightning Round is sponsored by Charles Schwab. Coming up, out of fashion, Kramer challenges the FTC's reaction to a luxury merger. Don't miss it. Next. I saw this morning that the FTC might be preparing to block Tapestry, the parent company of Coach Kate Spade and Stuart Weitzman, from buying Capri, the parent of Versace, Michael Kors, and Jimmy Choo. I actually thought it was a joke. It felt like a parody of the Federal Trade Commission's usual activities. Why even bother blocking this acquisition? It's not about monopolization or higher prices for goods. It's not even about workers whose jobs are plentiful in the apparel space. If anything, you actually want these two companies to merge so they can stay viable. The fashion business is hard, notoriously. Many fail. This deal could create a strong American company that could possibly compete with LVMH, the French house of luxury brands, which happened to report a weak quarter yesterday, and yet still went higher. I wish I could say the same thing about Capri, which has been getting pummeled ever since the company reported an amazingly weak quarter that questioned the rationale of the entire deal in February. It was so bad that I thought Tapestry might walk away. So if it's not monopolistic, if it's happening in the most fractured of industries, if the European Union and Japan have checked off it already, why, what's the point? Why bother to block it? I think it's simple. The administration hates mergers. This FTC particular dislikes companies with even a hint of power. Period. Full stop. By going after this petty deal, the FTC is saying, don't get your hopes up about more M&A. We're going to keep trying to stop deals because the only real beneficiary is the shareholder, and the shareholders are rich to begin with. This FTC, says, FTC seems allergic to big companies. They seem to think big companies hurt smaller companies just by existing. It's not just the FTC, though. I think the Justice Department's current antitrust division is just as hostile to business. Just look at the case it recently brought against Apple, one of the most bizarre episodes in so-called trespasser history. The gist of that case, Apple's phones are so good, you don't want to switch from them, and they make it hard to do anyway. You take the most beloved company in America, the one with the highest customer satisfaction rate, the envy of the world, and you basically sue it for making its customers too happy? Honestly, if you were to ask most Americans which company they regard as the most pro-consumer, I think it would be a tie between Amazon, which is already being sued by the FTC, and Apple, with new features that always astound and win over nearly everybody. Call me crazy, but I was actually hoping Assistant Attorney General Jonathan Cantor's antitrust division would go after actual antitrust violators. It's not hard to find companies that might be colluding to raise prices in lockstep. Sure feels like, doesn't it, when it comes to medical and auto insurance? Uh, or else they wouldn't have such severe inflation, stickiest of increases. Anything that goes relentlessly higher like insurance should be looked at, I think. Or, or how about the airlines, where the government allowed so many murders that it crushed competition, made the cost of flying much more expensive. Ticket prices seem to go up all the time. After all, Cantor was a corporate lawyer from Paul Weiss, uh, the firm I used for my work. I thought mistakenly that he'd seek answers for what hurts us, not attack those who help us. I thought he'd be more nuanced and less ideological. Looks like I was wrong. Cantor previously went after Alphabet, accusing them of being a monopolist in digital advertising, even as everybody on Wall Street knows that the company's losing its grip on that market. Now TikTok's the big dog. Advertisers don't have to go to Google. And by the way, they don't have to go to Google for advertising. They just go to Trade Desk. Now, let's just step back for a second and acknowledge why all this is happening. And let, let's just own it. We have a president who has historically not cared for big business or for, for investors. He picked people to represent his view. That's what's happening. Put a positive spin on it. He actually embraces the little guy. I think it's admirable. But everybody in this administration seems to think that you can only help the little guy by hurting the big guys. Even the ones that don't do anything wrong. And I think that's just a darn shame. I like to say there's always a bull market somewhere. I promise you I'll find it just for you right here on Mad Money. I'm Jim Kramer. See you tomorrow. Last call starts now. All opinions expressed by Jim Kramer on this podcast are solely Kramer's opinions and do not reflect the opinions of CNBC, NBC Universal, or their parent company or affiliates, and may have been previously disseminated by Kramer on television, radio, internet, or another medium. You should not treat any opinion expressed by Jim Kramer as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow a particular strategy, but only as an expression of his opinion. Kramer's opinions are based upon information he considers reliable, but neither CNBC nor its affiliates and or subsidiaries warrant its completeness or accuracy, and it should not be relied upon as such. To view the full Mad Money Disclaimer, please visit cnbc.com forward slash Mad Money Disclaimer.